Welcome into the Hot Read Podcast for Tuesday, March 27th. I'm your host, Easton Freeze, Director of Published Content here at BroadwaySportsMedia.com. We're also brought to you by the 440 Podcast Network. You can follow me on social media at Easton Freeze. I am joined on this lovely, tu- what is today, Tuesday, Monday, Wednesday? Today this is the show Tuesday. for Wednesday, isn't it? Yes. 
I, I can't tell what day it is. I can tell what time it is. And I know we're on time, JT. How are you? It's good to be on time for a show. It's good to start when we said we're going to start. Uh, how are you doing, my friend? April, April Fool's Day isn't until next Sunday or Monday, buddy. So, uh, gotcha. No, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. we got it. We got to get you in some like time it management it classes. Late. It happens. It happens on occasion to everybody. It happens to the best of us. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I would I would like to see if we can put a streak of one together of starting this show on time. But, you know, it, it's <laughs> I don't know if it'll ever I don't think as D good uh, just says in the call in, being... in the comments right there. If the show was run by JT, it would be on time. You want you want to know when the last time we went we were on time was probably when the show you where you were here. alone. <laughs> just just you. We I have been Lovely. on time before a streak of one is far. It's it, that's an exaggeration on your part. Uh, a streak of more than one in a row on time. That might not have happened in a while. Listen, do you want, because uh, here's the deal. I if I just had to show up and do nothing in preparation for the show, I'd be on time far more often. T JT will attest to this. Am I not on time? Yes. But is it because I'm like doing something else and then I run in late? And no, it's because I'm trying to get everything together for the show in preparation for the show for the highest quality product for you all, our listeners, who... I value and I value your time and I don't want to waste your time because listen, I typically set myself with, with an hour. Like I, I come into today, I have an idea of what, what I want my mock draft 1.0 to look like, which is the topic of today's discussion. And then I sit down at three o'clock and I say, I've got an hour to, to knock this out. Surely one hour is going to be enough time. And then lo and behold, <laughs> Chef Fred saying being coachable. I'm trying. I really am. Uh, lo and behold, it takes longer than that because I forgot how hard these things are to do. And I'm so OCD about it. JT can also attest to me being just a little bit OCD sometimes. Uh, I I want to get it perfect and I want to make sure it's right. And so could I have just phoned it in and put together a slapdash copy paste mock draft for you today in an hour? Yes, I absolutely I could have done that in 10 minutes. But I you know what? This is me spinning me being late as 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 me caring more about our listeners. Isn't that right? I, you know, that was a pretty good response. I wasn't expecting something like that. I, that's a pretty damn good response right there. Uh, I may come I, late, I, but I come prepared to explain away my lateness. When you're late as much as I am, uh, you get good at that. So uh, yeah. we appreciate you guys being here. Uh, we are, of course, today going through Mock Draft 1.0. Uh, we do three of these, or at least probably three. That's what we did last year. That felt like the right number. I think more than three is like, like you know find a new bit find a new angle uh like that's kind of lazy like wh what if we just did one like two a we could just be on mock draft 7.0 by uh draft time and people would hate us by then um but we'll do three and i like to make each one different and each one uh tends to have a different theme uh and so i'll i'll get into my general mindset the theme of my mindset going into this one in a minute it is going to be all 32 picks from the first round. I'm so glad, JT, by the way. Remember last year we had to do the 31 picks in the first round because the stupid Dolphins decided to tamper. No, 32 picks the way the Lord intended it in this first round. We'll be going through all of them. And uh, then I've got my seventh round mock draft for the Titans. So all of the Titans picks. Um, uh, today I decided not to do any first round trades for the Titans, but maybe some trades uh, further on in the draft for them. So a little, little teaser for you there. If you are with us live today, we appreciate you being with us. Do us a couple of favors. First, if you're watching anywhere besides YouTube, leave that place and go to YouTube. Type in Broadway Sports Media on YouTube and find this live stream on Broadway Sports Media's YouTube page. And the comment section of that video is where you can be a part of the conversation with all of my dear friends making fun of me for being late, like Adam and Derek and Ethan and uh, and, and Christopher and D-Good uh and chef ran all in in the comments already we appreciate you guys being here fellas it's going to be a good one today looking forward to you guys in the comments telling me how right i am about this perfect mock draft there has never been a perfect mock draft until today and you are the lucky few who get to witness it um if you are on youtube do us a favor while you're there and hit subscribe it's very easy it takes one click of the button it is free to you but it's very helpful to us we're trying to get that subscriber count up and up and up we're trying to get to a thousand by draft time uh, we're well on our way. So let's keep that number rising. And we appreciate you guys doing that for us. And then if you want to share the show, that'd be awesome. We'd appreciate you hitting the share button, hitting the retweet button, the like button, all of those things. Very helpful to us. And again, free to you. So let's dive in JT to mock draft 1.0. Oh, no, actually hold that thought because before we do, uh, let's spend like five, 10 minutes. I just want to talk through a couple of the things we learned from the owners meetings this week. They went on 
I think they're still going on technically in Orlando. All the owners jet set in and uh, talk about things with coaches and GMs uh, for a couple of days in Orlando. And there are some rule changes that are made. We've got a couple of big rule changes that we're not going to spend the entire episode today talking about, but maybe just give our general thoughts on JT. There's one very cool rule change and one not very cool rule change. Which one would you like to start with here? Uh, let's start with the not cool one. Okay, so that would be the swivel hip drop tackle Indeed. being outlawed in the NFL by a unanimous vote from the uh, rules committee. Uh, it's not the hip drop tackle they have banned. No, no, my friend. If the hip drop tackle was not already a confusing enough category of tackle, we have subdivided it into two, one of which is legal, they say. We'll see if that holds up. And one of which is illegal, and that is the swivel hip drop tackle, which essentially involves a defender wrapping around the midsection to upper section of a defender or of an offensive player running away from them. Uh, the, the language is then unweighting themselves, which is a fun way of saying falling down, unweighting themselves whilst holding on to the uh, offensive player and then rotating their body and landing upon the offensive players lower body land, landing on their legs. It is a dangerous tackle and it's a tackle that results in a number of lower body injuries. Uh, a couple of memorable ones last year. Was, wasn't Mark Andrews hurt on a hip drop tackle? He was uh, another one, important one. Now, now currently now on the Titans, to, former Cowboys, Tony Pollard it was injured that way right. with a, with a tackle that they are trying to get rid of. Um, it's, it's one that you see, have been seeing a lot, more and more of and I think that's why they did it do I necessarily agree with it no mostly because I, I don't think that it, it's a dangerous play more so I think it's so it would be so hard to to enforce to kind of enforce this that it's going to lead to a lot of interesting decisions yes I, I think this sucks I hate that they did it I'm not super shocked that they did um, but yeah like and here's the thing I understand it, it sometimes feels like every year they're kind of like, I'm not accusing them of doing this in this instance, but it sometimes feels like the NFL trying to be so not just conscious of player safety, but make sure everybody is aware that they're conscious of player safety by constantly adding a thing here. Well, we're, we're trying to be more safe because we're going to add this and we're going to change this. We're going to remove that because player safety guys, not to mention, you know, then they turn around on a day like today and say, hey, by the way, Christmas is on a Wednesday. Double header, baby. Don't care if the players only have 48 hours to rest. We're getting them in there for four games because we own Christmas. The NBA can suck it. Uh, but they care about player safety, I promise. And so they're going to outlaw things like the swivel hip drop tackle. And it, folks that agree with this, I, I understand you're, like you want the players to be safe. I, here's, here's where I, you have to draw the line. Football is functionally, by definition, a... In, unsafe activity like it is a dangerous sport it is football is regulated violence right and so if you want there to be no inherent risk at all then you really do have to go full jj watt as he said on twitter and just put the flags on right um so somewhere you have to draw the line between like gratuitous unnecessary risks and the natural risks of playing a game that is by definition regulated violence and i just think they're making it so, I mean, it has to be so impossible to be, a, and, and really frustrating maybe more than anything, to be a defender in the modern NFL, JT. It's like, if you want to tackle a guy, which is, you know, your primary job, all you have to remember is you can't hit him high or low or rotate when you fall to the ground. Other than that, you're golden. So good luck. Have fun out there. Like, it's, 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 it has to be infuriating. Yeah, I, I would agree there. It, it, it seems more and more now that becoming a defender is twice as hard as an offensive player. Like it almost like yes. if you're if you're playing on the offensive side of the ball, it's almost like you have to do twice as less things as, as the defensive side of the ball or worry about twice, twice as, less. as less. In other words, half. Yes. Yes, the... correct. I <laughs> uh, see even even the verbiage that I'm making up here confuses me. Right. Because well, that's is, about as sensical as unweighting yourself. So I'll give you a yes. pass. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, I, I hate that. And it's it, more than anything. Here's, here's my last point. It is such a subjective call um, that, and they've, they've said like, well, we, it's funny at first, I don't know if you read in their initial language when they announced this was we're confident the refs are going to be able to call this. And then like four or five hours later, they came out during the press conference. They're like, 
listen, we're going to make sure this is called, and we only want the refs to call it if it's obvious on the field, but there's going to be a number of misses, and we're going to review the tape, and we'll we'll hand out fines for missed calls throughout. Hank, pause. What happened to you? You're confident the refs are going to be able to call this. Like, we, we every single week, it feels like, see these referees have trouble with the most rudimentary elements of, like, just the most procedural elements of their job, like spotting the ball, making sure the time clock is correct, resetting the the uh, play clock. Like, they struggle with these things. And so we think, let's just, I don't think it's fair to add anything more to their brains. Like, hey, I need you to be watching out for this now as well. What it is, is kind of subjective, and it's technically difficult. Um, and these things are happening at a million miles an hour out there. So just add it to the many things you're already having to think about. I think it's dumb, and I think it's going to result in some aggressively like you just what was it week what's the over under week two week three when a game ends and in the last five minutes there's a 15 yard swivel hip drop tackle penalty that arguably impacts the outcome of the game and, and it's you know the the clip is on twitter ten thousand times and it's just infuriating and then we're talking about it on the show it's going to happen quickly Yes, I mean, when, when this was announced, I had a friend text me yesterday or two days ago whenever this was announced and said, uh, I'd like to preemptively tell us both. It's okay, buddy. It's not your fault for when we inevitably lose money on a terrible <laughs> hip drop tackle call. And I guess, yes. you know. It, yeah, gum it. It's not just me losing the money gambling on that. This. It's not just me losing it. It's another reason for the NFL to just find players for dumb reasons, I feel like. Yes. And I yes. think just when you put all of these things together, it's a dumb rule and, and I'm against it. Wasn't it Jalen Warren last year who caught like three out of four weeks in a row? He was getting a big fat fine for some something he did. And it was like he, he accumulated like $100,000 in fines. And it was like a quarter of his. Well, I'm, I'm so blurry. What What's happening? Uh, hello. I'm going to let the camera fix itself. Uh, and it was like a fourth of his annual salary. And we're like, the NFL takes away millions of dollars worth of these guys salaries every year. Uh, I, I don't, I don't see it as a good thing for them to add another one of those things. And I know this is funny because it looks like I'm, I'm like an anonymous person in a uh, Netflix documentary <laughs> who agreed to speak on the condition of yeah, anonymity. You can't, you can't speak out against big NFL right now with the hip drop tackle. They're censoring you know? me live. They're Are we seeing this? Because of this. Um, we can talk about the one that is, I go. think, good okay. for the NFL, though, which is the new kickoff yes. rule, which I find very electric. Yes, it's so cool. And we, I, you and I were watching... The, the context of this does not matter, but you and I were watching over lunch an XFL game in its inaugural season in um uh where were we in North Carolina? Uh, Durham, maybe? Durham. That's the place. Yes, uh, North Carolina cities. Uh, we were in Durham watching this at a random lunch place at the inaugural season. It was the first time I'd ever seen this kickoff, and I was like, "What's going on? This is interesting." And I researched it, and I, I I I think I tweeted like four times in a week that week. I, I would kill to see this in the NFL. I never thought they'd actually do it. And so now here we are. And if I, we won't sit here and try to explain it exactly to you, but essentially it is a new kickoff rule that keeps the two teams from running at each other 50 yards down the field, like gladiator style and creating car crash collisions. <laughs> um, they're going to run at each other from what? 10 yards apart. And I believe it's they essentially are, yeah, 10 yards apart. Correct. Yeah. And so, and, but then but other than where they start on the field, it's essentially the same procedure um, like I had some folks complaining to me, like, oh, it looks so gimmicky. It looks so dumb. The funny thing is you watch examples of it from the XFL. If you close your eyes for the first two seconds of the play, wait for the ball to be in the returner's hands and then open them. It looks like the exact same play because the players are engaging. They're blocking the guys running up field. It's so sick. But what it's going to do is not only keep the players safer, but it's also going to encourage people to actually return kickoffs. It's going to make the kickoff exciting thing something that's not because right now the kickoff is when you go to the bathroom check your phone go to concessions you do anything but watch the game because it's a it, it was it was a procedural thing at best and the nfl um was dealing with i think only 22 percent of kickoffs last year were returned and they realized we're killing this part of football we need to bring it back i think this is going to bring it back um because the 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 touchback now comes out to the 35 right so you're not incentivized to kick into the end zone um, you're also not incentivized as a return team to let the ball land short and then roll into the end zone, because if it does, then the touchback's only 20 yards. And so like, I think everything works out perfectly and it's going to bring back hopefully a golden age of returners. That's what I'm most excited about. Like bring us, bring us the prime quarter Patterson's bring us, bring us these dudes that are just going to electrify 
at this one specific thing um, and teams are going to value them in that way. Yeah, I would agree. Okay. Um, anything else from the uh, meetings? It's uh, well, one thing that to transition to our mock draft uh, one, one note from uh, the Titans media that was there speaking to Titans head coach, Brian Callahan uh, about the, the Titans current roster situation. Sounds like that they are in the headspace of draft a tackle and add a tackle somewhere in free agency along the line. And then also at the linebacker position, we, we, we're kind of fond of these linebackers in this, in this draft class, even though the, the buzz has been elsewhere. And uh, I think it's officially time to start including linebackers and Titans mock drafts based on what head coach Brian Callahan had to say. Another spoiler for uh, later on in the seven round Titans mock draft, but let's start JT with the 32 pick first round mock that I've done. And like I said, I do not have the Titans trading in this mock. I'm sure I will have a first round trade in the next mock or the next mock or whatever it is. But in this one, I kept it simple. They are picking at seven. I do have one trade up for a quarterback because that feels like it's going to happen inevitably. Um, and it's for the team that you expect. So let's go ahead and show this first slide, the first six picks here. And I will explain the thinking behind these guys. It's also ultimately a good avenue, I think, for us to, to talk about these guys uh, specifically um, for the really the first time all at once this season. So I'm, I'm stoked that we're in draft season and get to talk about these guys full time now. And the first pick bears no introduction. Bears. Huh, no, no pun intended. Uh, it's Caleb Williams to the Chicago Bears. Take out Justin Fields, adding Caleb Williams. Uh, him and his pink phone case and all are, are headed to Chicago. And uh, I think that this is a pretty obvious thing that if it were not to be the case would be the uh, most shocking turn of events in draft history in the past three, four, five years. It, at this point, it is so uh, th this, the secret is so out that I, I don't think that anybody is questioning this pick. Now, the second pick, plenty of folks are questioning. And I've got Drake May going to the Washington Commanders at number two. There's always one guy every draft cycle that as a community NFL draft media psychs themselves out about or overanalyzes or overthinks or buys into the smoke coming from NFL teams far too much. And I think that guy is Drake may a lot of talk about how this is going to be Jaden Daniels or even from the, the coaches or excuse me, the owners meetings in Orlando just a couple of days ago. Uh, uh, some, I think one of the guys on the NFL network saying, uh, you know, from a straw poll of the, the GMs that I've talked to here, it sounds like the favorite for number two for Washington, JJ McCarthy out of Michigan, not buying it. I, I think that Drake may is the second best quarterback in this draft class. Pretty clearly to me, we'll talk more about the distinctions between these guys in our top 10 quarterbacks episode in a couple of weeks, but I'll just say, I think that the talent is undeniable. The frame is undeniable. The skill set is undeniable. I, I don't dislike J.J. McCarthy or Jane Daniels. This is not a diss on them as much as it is. I think that Drake may genuinely just is that guy. Uh, at the beginning of this draft cycle, I think folks were right to question, you know, the narrative of, well, Caleb and Drake, 1A, 1B. I think that Caleb is, is a fair one, but I think that dropping Drake to two is as far as you should drop him. And so I think that the NFL is going to see it that way. And I think that he is going to be a top two pick at number three. I've got the Patriots going with Jaden Daniels. Now I don't know if I personally love this fit, but I do know that apparently Bill Belichick before he left and I'm fuzzy again, my camera is just broken today. Uh, I know that before he left, it was reported that Bill Belichick was uh, awfully fond of Jaden Daniels out of LSU. And that's something that I find interesting, but it would not shock me if the the uh, residual Belichickian era staff there are still very high on him as well. And I think that they are going to want their quarterback. I also know that at the beginning of this draft process, JT, we heard from the the what's his official the functional GM, whatever head of scouting. Or I think he was the there. director of scouting. Yeah. OK, Before director of scouting. Patriots, yes. The, the functional GM of the New England Patriots. Uh, did an interview uh, like in January where he out said out loud, yeah, we're going to take the best quarterback on the board. Whoever's there at three, that's probably who we're going to target. Um, and so they've since changed their tune about, well, maybe not. And, you know, maybe we don't take a quarterback at all. And this year we just read, I'm not buying it. I think that it will be a quarterback at three. Now things start to get interesting. The Cardinals at four with JJ McCarthy still on the board and a handful of teams that see the quarterbacks flying off one, two, three. They desperately want one. 
and they're going to want to trade up to four for him. I, I know that last year the Cardinals and uh, former Titans legend Monty Austin Ford, the new GM out there, did a whole lot of trading back and a whole lot of adding capital. And would it shock me if he continues that trend and that's just kind of his thing? No, it wouldn't. But I do think that there's a big difference between where the Cardinals were last year and where they are now. And there comes a time when you're trading back and rebuilding and adding capital and just trying to get dart throws that you have to stop and add blue chip talent. It's time to transition, uh, shift gears on your team building strategy and start adding guys that are not luxury picks, but are more quality over quantity because you, you know, you've, you've done the quantity part. And I want to say this is where that starts to change for the Cardinals. Marvin Harrison Jr. Being there on the board, the idea of pairing him with Kyler Murray, where that wide receiver room, I mean, who it's, it's Greg Dortch and uh, Rondell Moore, I believe Rondell Moore, right? Michael sure. Wilson, okay. maybe, uh, wait, who did they, who'd they trade for, uh, who'd they trade to Atlanta? Was it Rondell Moore that they traded to Atlanta for? They might, uh, yeah. No, you're right. Ron, I think I think right now it's Greg Dorch and Michael Wilson. I, I think Rondell yeah, Moore okay. is on the Falcons. That's a weird trade the, that I forgot about. Yep. Yeah, it's it's easy to forget. Maybe the strangest outright trade of the uh, of the season so far. But yes, the the point being, they need a receiver, and Marvin Harrison Jr. is that one A guy uh, at very worst, at very best, one of the best receiving talents we've seen in the draft in a long, long time. And so I think they take him, add him with Kyler. Don't hesitate for a second turn down some very rich offers and so the fourth quarterback falls to number five where the vikings do eventually spend those two first round picks they've accumulated in the past month or so um they they trade up with the chargers for that number five spot the reason why i think it's at five is because the chargers if you've been paying attention have really uh done a horrendous job of keeping it a secret that they want out it's the worst kept secret in the draft cycle i feel like in the top 10 the chargers are at five and they would love nothing more than to trade with you and get out of that pick and so i think that they do that they move back they accumulate two first round picks in exchange for number five overall and the vikings get their guy on jj mccarthy i think that uh the vikings ultimately based on what i have heard and reading the tea leaves i think that they are in on may or mccarthy probably in that order but those seem to be their guys. I'd be really surprised if they went after a Jaden Daniels. I just don't think that that matches the KOC um, system, the style that he's running up there. Uh, Kevin O'Connell doing a very good job, but I think a JJ McCarthy would be ideal. And he's somebody that if you wanted to, I mean, they just spent $10 million on a one year deal for Sam Darnold. If you wanted to have him sit for half a season for a full season and ride it out with Sam Darnold, not the end of the world, but they need their quarterback. And I think that for them, JT, it's a, a massive failure this off this entire offseason really is if they don't get one of those top four guys based on the moves that they've already made i mean for sure i think that they have you they're really stuck in that position right now with sam darnold and, and you kind of feel like it's a it's a where they have to plant their flag on one of these guys and you saw the trade that they made already with the Houston Texans to go and acquire that other first round pick. It really mm -hmm. does feel like the, all signs are saying it, it's whoever who is on the board there after two, because I think what the commanders do is really telling for them. And then they go from there um, and all signs point to kind of Kevin O'Connell and, and this regime's future being relied on the guy they pick here. How do you think uh, Justin Jefferson feels about this whole situation? How nervous do you think he is about anybody but Donald? Here we go. Anybody but Donald 2024. I Please, mean, I'm begging you. It's very interesting. It's very interesting how Justin Jefferson might be able to elevate JJ McCarthy just because he is Justin Jefferson alone mm -hmm. uh, in that. Well, and he's not the only system. good receiver on that on that team, by the way. I mean, they've got they've got they've got some some really nice options um, in that in that offense. And so. Yeah, I think that that is a big deal. Any other questions, comments on these top five picks? I don't want to just steamroll right through without a, um, any input from Chef, you or from the, Chef Rand oh. says here that top six is that top six is perfect for a trade back. Somebody would come up for Malik Neighbors, which I think as as you well, mock I'm there to, to number five, a difference uh, of opinion. Yeah, with Roma Dunze, clearly you are on the uh, on the train that Roma Dunze might be a little bit higher than Malik Navis. Malik neighbors, um, Malik neighbors, <laughs> Malik neighbors, Derek in the comments also said, who is catching passes from Jay Herbo this year? Maybe interesting well, to 
Uh, they, they've got two picks that. coming up, so let's let's find in, out in a, yeah. in a second. And then Chef Rand also saying, I think the Chargers could trade up to seven, back to seven, and get the wide receiver three this year, that which would be really interesting. After that, trade. not it. You're not a, an unbelievable scenario, but that's not where I went with this one because I went with Roma Dunze at six. Um, and this is probably the first big step out from the consensus that I've made in this mock draft. And let me explain why. Part of it is my philosophy on this wide receiver group. And part of it is where I think the Giants are. The Giants part is easy. They have the past two or three seasons in a row now accumulated talent at receiver. But it's been a t they've got like seven slot guys on their team. It's like they're trying to put three little guys in a trench coat and call them one outside wide receiver one. Um, it's time for them to go and get that guy. And I'm not saying that league neighbors couldn't be functionally a wide receiver one um, on this team just based on the attention and production that he demands. But I am saying that I think a Roma Dunze, a bigger bodied, more traditional X receiver could go a long way for Daniel Jones and for this Giants team. And I think that's where they ultimately go here. The reason why I right now am leaning a Dunze over neighbors and man, is it really tough? It is really tough. I'm trying to think who's more likely to be a wide receiver one and, and what a wide receiver one is, is a like it's defined differently by different people. The way that I define it is very, very similar to the way that Daniel Jeremiah defines it. And I heard or just earlier today, him on a podcast, I think with Joel Klatt, if I'm remembering correctly, him talking about his distinction between these guys. And I couldn't agree more for me. A wide receiver one is when it's third down and it's the end of the game, or it's an obvious passing down situation. And everybody in the stadium, on the field, in Jersey, with the team, in the stands, everybody knows where the ball is going, and it doesn't matter. The defense can't do anything about it. That's a wide receiver one to me. It's prime DeAndre Hopkins on third and five in the slot. You know he's hitting that comeback, and there's nothing you can do about it. He's going to fall down for six yards, and it's a wrap. For me, it's Roma Dunze. I think that he is more likely to be that wide receiver one dominant take over a game player. Now, Malik Neighbors has more explosiveness. He's more liable to have games where he goes for eight, eight receptions, 157 yards because he broke off two massive plays because he's just so explosive and squirrely back there. He's impossible to bring down and he'll run right around you. But Roma Dunze, I think, is going to be more of that traditional guy. And for that reason, I think the Giants could really benefit from having him. I have him off the board before Malik Neighbors. What are your thoughts on that, JT? Yeah, I mean, I agree with you that if the Giants were trying to pick between Roma Dunze and Malik Neighbors, I think Adunze is their guy because if you just you have to go back to the first two years of OBJ since they've had that prime X factor guy that has been able mm -hmm. to win on the outside. The Giants, for for lack of not trying, literally, they, they, they their attempt was Kenny Galladay, and it did not work out whatsoever. But yeah. um, you don't think, you don't think be, that worked out for him? <laughs> would be the answer <laughs> to yeah. all of their problems that they have been suffering. I mean, you you can only send out a Sterling Shepard, Wandale Robinson, Darius Slayton group for so many years and just not see it work. I understand that quarterback is still just a very big glaring issue for them, but. If your plan is to try to ride out this Daniel Jones contract a little bit longer, getting a guy like Roma Dunze, who Daniel Jones can just throw it up to, and you know the old saying, "Screw it, he's down there somewhere." I, right. I think that could R definitely Roma, Roma work Dunze, out the, for them. Yeah, the best contested of these three guys, easily the best contested catch receiver in this group, and so yeah, a hundred percent. Um, I trust him to be that guy. A couple of folks in the comments here, bottom tier collector saying, please let this mock pan out in real life. I'm team Joel for Tennessee. He can already see where this is going for the Titans. Chef Ran saying he agrees with me. Oh, Derek and Chef Ran agreeing with me on this take. I appreciate you agreeing me because I think I'm right. Um, and then Derek saying on, on a Dunze, he is my draft crush. Unfortunately, the Titans have bigger needs though. I am with you on that JT. I know you and I left Indianapolis Awfully fond of one Roma Dunze. I would love nothing more than to cover him. He seems like a great dude on the field and off the field. I think that whoever gets him is going to be so pleased. And he is very high on my list of players this year, not just general talents, but guys that I'm confident are going to pan out in the NFL one way or another. I think that he has everything that it takes to be a, a good NFL player. Everything besides knowing how to land a plane. 
that that is for sure. Well, well, I, we can say co- confidence in himself landing a plane because he might actually could do it. We just don't. He's not tried yet. So maybe we need this to, is true. You are right. Whichever team lands him. So social team, get him in a flight simulator. Just see what happens. It's good content. All right, let's move on to the next one. And it's going to start off with the Titans at number seven. We went chalk with this first mock draft. I, I thought, do I, you know, everybody and their mother and their brother and their sibling and their dog um, all have Joe Alt going to the Titans at seven partially because we're lazy and group think is a thing. Uh, but more than that, just because it makes a whole lot of sense. Right. And I thought long and hard about, do I zig while everyone else is zagging on this first mock draft? And I thought we're doing three of these. I'm sure I will have a strong itch in two, three weeks when we do this again to do something different. So now let's just, let's play it safe. Let's go Joe Alt at seven. And by no means, is this a poor pick for the Titans? I don't need to sit here and explain for a long time why Alt should be the pick at seven if they're wanting to go offensive line. He is the best tackle in this class. Uh, him and Peter Skaronsky will make the most like Milwaukee cop, Midwestern, pasty white boy, runs a pizza shop on the side, left side of the uh, offensive line. It's going to be uh, pretty terrible for those of us in the media, honestly, because the both of them, gr- great guys from what I can tell but not the most vocal animated guys in the world. So it might be the most milk toast left side of the line ever, but boy, would it be talented boy? Would it be nice to have a lockdown side for this Titans offensive line and for Will Levis. Um, One quick, just Titan specific thing right now. Uh, I know that a lot of folks were wondering why were the Titans not, you know, the top brass was not in attendance at Joe Alt's pro day at Notre Dame. And I saw uh, some reporting from our buddy Paul Karski here, a uh, fellow member of the 440 Podcast Network, talking about, uh, and he is in Orlando uh, covering the owners' meetings this week, about how the Titans did have some folks there, but they did not have any of their top guys there. There was a scheduling planning change at the last minute as to what Joe Alt was actually going to do at his pro day, and that may have led to the Titans not sending uh, some of the same guys that otherwise would. It's also fair to point out that Last year, they did not attend. Uh, they did not attend Peter Skaronsky's pro day either. They did bring him for a visit, and you can you can bet everything to your name that they're going to bring in Peter Skor- excuse me, uh, Joe Alt for a visit this year. But they were not in attendance for uh, his pro day. But last year, their first round pick, they weren't in attendance for his either. So I don't think that necessarily means anything. Um, JT, any problem with the the most bland pick ever? No, I think it fe- it. it- it's Perfectly, good. It's smart. It's it, it, feel, it fills the need that, that they glaringly still have on this team. And it sets you up to finally have an answer on the left side of the line for years to come. I think it's a home run pick that you, it, we, we talk about all the time. Can't miss. Uh, obviously the player could like the player could not work out, but this pick right here is a no brainer that I think if you know, it, it's not it's not a home run pick, as we were talking about last year. It's the safe pick, right? You're, you're just getting on for a single because, you know, you're trying to build into something more. Um, and, and that's what Joe Alt is. Kenneth in the comments asking, does Greg Cosell's concerns about Joe Alt make you pause at all? Uh, it's a good question. I'm glad you brought this up. So generally, Cosell, and I don't, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but this has been a couple of weeks, but from what I remember, it was a lot of, well, he doesn't win with power a whole lot. He's a handsy player. He wins with finesse and technique, and it's not – it's not as strong and aggressive as some tackles. And I think that's more of a preference thing than anything. My, my rebuttal to that would be, I just, in the NFL today, a lot of very good tackles win that exact same way. They win with technique. They win with finesse. They, they, they win by um, playing, playing. How would I, how would I, sharply and quickly and uh, without, without raw unbridled power. Um, is the best way that I would I would explain it. Now, that's not to say that Joe Alt is not powerful as a player, but when you compare his play style to like a J.C. Latham, for example, who may very well be the strongest player in this draft class, it's a different style. I just think that that's Greg Cosell showing his preference a little bit, which is perfectly fine as to what kind of player he prefers uh, on the outside of an offensive line. I think a lot of teams in today's NFL are perfectly fine with the play style of Joe Alt. And um, while those concerns are noted, I, I don't think that that would be an issue for most NFL teams if they knew how to s- scheme him and, and use him in that way. Uh, okay, number eight, Dallas Turner, Turner to the Falcons. First defensive player off the board. The Falcons have to be jazzed because they get the the, the guy that I'm sure they think is the best defensive player in this draft class. They have need uh, edge rush help 
since like the Obama administration. I think it's been a long time since the the Falcons have been able to get after. I mean, the, quarterback the last the last time that they way. that they had as somewhat of a semblance of a good pass rush was the one year that Vic Beasley was like. I was about really to say, I, I know you're going with this Titans legend Vic Beasley, uh, a CTC king, cash that check. Um, yes, and that was like 2016, I think, one year, yeah. and then he disappeared. Um, so yeah, Dallas Turner, home run pick for the Falcons. Wasn't it their GM or coach? Who was it that got caught like going crazy over Dallas Turner's 40 time at the combine? Wasn't that a Falcons guy? Do you even know what I'm talking I'm not sure. about? No, I don't. Okay. So somebody in their team box got caught going, getting a little bit animated over his 40 <laughs> time. And I think, I think it was a Falcons guy, but I could be wrong. Okay. Number nine, finally Malik neighbors ends his skid on the, uh, on the board here falls to the bears who I'm sure that bears are delighted by this because they get to add him to what a wide receiver room of DJ Moore and Keenan Allen and all is hunky dory. And I'd imagine Justin Fields is somewhere waving his fist in the air saying, I never got to do who, where was this when I was in Chicago? Rightfully so. That's a fair gripe. Beth, them's just the breaks kids. So Caleb Williams, DJ Moore, Keenan Allen, and Malik neighbors who oh, baby. That's a nice, that's a nice little set of weapons there in Chicago. The revitalization of a franchise that uh, could desperately use it uh, at this point. Number 10, Brock Bowers comes off the board. A guy that's kind of tricky to find your spot. Now he goes to the jets at 10. Is this the smart pick for the New York jets football franchise? No, it absolutely is not. If they were a smart, forward-thinking organization, they would go with a tackle. They may consider a quarterback, uh, but that's not where they are. They are a, a GM and a head coach and a quarterback who are all playing for their jobs, two of them because they're going to get fired, and one of them because he's about to not be able to do this physically anymore because he's so old, uh, or might run for vice president, one of the two. And so... This is the kind of move you make after in free agency. They have gone out and signed a handful of, of, of nice deals for offensive linemen to help bolster the protection for Rodgers. And uh, they, they've gotten to a place where is their offensive line great? No, I still, if I were them, I'd go like, hey, Talisa Fuaga, um, Olaf Fashionu, JC Latham. I'd line those boys up right here if I was the GM. But again, this GM and this head coach are on essentially one year contracts because if it doesn't work this year, they know they're gone. And so they are getting a guy that they think that can be explosive and, and bring a, a big explosive element to that team. Brock Bowers, obvious choice there. Now at 11, Talisa Fuaga, the first of the Chargers, two first round picks. Uh, they move back with Minnesota to 11 and the Chargers take home Talisa Fuaga. I think this pick is a match made in heaven. I also made it over going with like a JC Latham, going with an Olaf Fashionu because if you look at Daniel Jeremiah's mock draft, this is who he has them taking. And when it comes to the Chargers in particular, who Daniel Jeremiah is very closely uh, in, in lockstep with generally, he works for the Chargers organization. He does play-by-play -play for them. I tend to think that he knows best when it comes to predicting what that team's going to do. And so I, I defer to him on which offensive lineman will they take? Okay, it's Talisa Fuaga. No problem with it whatsoever. A dog. Um, he he, he I, Our buddy Stoney comped him it was it Freddy Krueger? I think he comped him to the other day, which is a great comp because it's like the, the general vibe you get when you watch Talisa Fuaga is do not let this man find you or he will end you. Uh, he is a nasty, nasty football player. Fantastic at what he does. And what he does is road great till the cows come home in the run game and is a absolutely above average serviceable uh, pass defender. I think that he'd be a home run pick to play inside or out for the Chargers. He's got versatility because I think he's just that good of an athlete. Quinion Mitchell, second defender off the board, number 12 to the Broncos. A lot of directions the Broncos could go here, obviously. I went with cornerback for this reason. that You, you could argue well, of all the needs they have, cornerback, you know, they've already got arguably the best cornerback in the league in um, uh, uh, Can't, uh, totally blank on it. Pat Sertain. Pat, Pat Sertain. Sertain, yeah. Um, I, the reason why I want to uh, pair, in my opinion, the best cornerback in this draft class in Quinion Mitchell with a Pat Sertain is because I think it'd be nice for them in the rebuild to have one position on defense, at least, where they can really hang their hats on. Like, hey, at cornerback, we have a really good group, young group set up for the future. We, you don't have to worry about this position anymore. And so that's why I went with Quinion Mitchell there at 12. Any questions, comments, thoughts, JT, on 7 through 12 here? 
I think the the biggest thing is just no matter where these players are going, it, it, it cannot be emphasized enough that the fact that there, I, I do feel like this is the number of defensive players that will go in the top 12. Like I think two is two. the limit, which, which mm. is crazy to me this year because there is so much good defensive talent out there in this draft class. Yet the offensive talent is just so much more needed and also there as well, which I think is a a really interesting thing. But like just looking at it right now, I I really do feel like the the maximum is two in the first 12. When you look at like these positions of need for all of these teams. Uh, Looking at the comments here, just I agree with that, obviously, JT. Um, D good saying PK already confirmed a 30 visit for all. If you're thinking of the tweet that I am thinking of, I, I'm not sure that was confirmation as much as it was just him stating the obvious. Now, maybe he, I'm missing another tweet, um, but if it's the one where he was talking about where his conversation with Chad Brinker, I don't think that that was actually confirmation of a visit. I think that that was just stating what is eventually going to happen, uh, but I could be wrong. So correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Kenneth asking, do you, con- did you consider Penix for the Broncos? I did. And I didn't have him go there. Because I do not think he's a top 12 player. And because I don't think that he's somebody that Sean Payton would be crazy about. He doesn't strike me as a Sean Payton style player all that much. Um, and so I don't think that they are would be in on him, but perhaps not. I mean, listen, Payton at the owners meetings just a couple of days ago saying that quarterback is certainly in play for them. And they're thinking about it and even potentially wanting to trade up. I don't know if that is something that they'd out, would actually do and if, if that's something that is seriously on their to-do list because they are so hamstrung with the assets they currently have, but that is an option. Now, that being said, JT, if we can go to the next slide, I do think that Michael Penix is a top 13 player, uh, and so I have him going to the the Las Vegas Raiders. Now, I say that flippantly because I don't actually personally believe he's a top 13 player in this class, not even close. He might not even be a top 40 or 50 player, but the reports, the rumors from the Raiders camp about how, Hey, you know, they've got, uh, they've got a little Gardner Minshew action and a little Aiden O'Connell in a second year action. And those are the guys in the QB room already, but they want to elevate their game. And they are fond of one Michael Penix jr. Quarterback out of Washington. Maybe we go and get him and add him. Would it be an overdraft? Yes. But I do think folks will say Easton five quarterbacks, not just in the first round, but in the top 15 picks, We do this every year. You're getting way too excited for these quarterbacks. Maybe. Totally. Like that 100% could be a case. But my rebuttal is we know how aggressively disappointing next year's quarterback class appears as of right now. And we know that in the NFL, every single year, the temperature gauge on every team who does not have a quarterback, their need to go and get a quarterback somewhere if you want to keep your job, it feels like it rises just a little bit and a little bit. And if you don't have a dude, you're, you're on borrowed time as a GM, as a head coach, as a coaching staff. And so I think that they're pair that with the Raiders just generally not being the world's most competent organization when it comes to the offseason. We've seen them do this whole song and dance before and make some questionable decisions. Would this be a questionable one? Yes. Would it be among their most questionable they've ever made? Maybe not, because I think that Penix is a unique scheme fit for a Raiders offense. I think that um, he could do well with that team and he'd have some weapons at his disposal. And so I've got Penix going at 13 before we move forward. Is this harebrained? Am I in too deep on the quarterbacks in this class? Maybe I am. You might be on, on Michael Penix there. Now, could I see it happening for sure? I like it, there, there is a real possibility that Michael Penix goes to the Raiders there and he's a day one starter. I think you look at the team right behind him as well with the saints and say, could Michael Penix be a guy that they sit behind Derek Carr once they shed that contract and, and move on from him? potentially as well but you are right in in the sense that if you don't take a quarterback this year when you are a quarterback needy team next year's options are going to make it even harder for you to keep your job if you were not successful so I I do think that the reasoning behind taking another quarterback in the top 15 is super valid um so at 14, uh, I, I went with J.C. Latham for the Saints. And here's the reasoning why. I, we, I think it was today we found out a report from, again, Orlando at the owners' meetings. Saints tackle Ryan Ramchek, already an older player, coming back from a knee injury. And reportedly, his knee is not healing in the way that the Saints and his doctors were hoping it would be. And so the Saints admitting today at the, at the, uh, at the owners' meetings, hey, we we might have to go and find another solution because I'm not sure he's going to be 
uh, healthy enough to play to start this season, if at all this season. And so that makes you wonder, okay, they already kind of needed a tackle move here. They needed a, a, a tackle addition because on the other side of the line, you've got left tackle Trevor Penning out of, oh, where's something Trevor with from? a cat. I want to say, yeah, it, I, I, I'm, I think I'm literally cat. picturing the purple cat Northwestern. I looked that up for me. I will. Um, Iowa state. I don't know. Um, that's not a cat. I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, the, the reason why I went with Latham here instead of another tackle is essentially because Northern Iowa, while you and Northern I. Iowa, I knew it was somewhere in that little bread basket. Okay. Um, so Northern Iowa pro product, Trevor Penning, two year player now coming into his third season, I believe. I, I don't think he is somebody they are, are happy with long term. He's just not working all that well, but he's going to have to this year if Ramchek can't go. And so with Latham, I think it's the perfect pick because if you have to keep penning at the left side and replace Ramchek on the right, Latham is coming in as a right tackle, having played that position in college. And I think that he is a versatile enough player, as we've talked about a little bit on the show already, to, to switch sides. He, he arguably would have been a left tackle if not for Evan Neal when he showed up to Alabama a couple of years ago. I, I think that he could play either side, and I think you could start him in his career at right and move him to left if you eventually want him to replace Trevor Penning, and that really just continues to be a failed experiment. And so I think Latham over a Troy Fontenew, a, a uh, Olaf Ashenew, that's the reason why I went with that guy, because he presents the most right side, left side tackle versatility. Yeah, no, I agree with you there. I think it's a, it's a need now that they have that I think is growing, and it's because it was something that we didn't really consider so i think their draft strategy now becomes a lot clearer there at 15 i went with the uh the colts taking terry and arnold cornerback out of alabama uh it, it, it's gotta be arnold or, or quinion mitchell here for for the colts they were in uh it reportedly on the luxurious sneed sweepstakes ultimately not in at the end of the day and they are in need of a outside starting corner based on uh, our buddy Zach Hicks over with uh, Locked on Colts and uh, a, another Colts publication that I cannot remember off the top of my head. He does great work, Zach Hicks on Twitter. Uh, he he does a lot of profiling Chris Ballard guys. And in terms of the cornerback class, it's very much not Nate Wiggins. It's very much not Kool-Aid McKinstry. Those are not stereotypical Ballard guys. Terry and Arnold and Quinnon Mitchell are. So Arnold was there at 15. I'm going with Arnold for the Colts. They need him badly. At 16, Troy Fontenot. Now, the, the, the Seahawks here at 16, by the way, taking Troy Fontenot, a tackle slash offensive lineman out of uh, Washington. He's a guy that I have heard in the last week or so, JT, rumblings about how not only do I think this guy can play on either side of the offensive line at the tackle position, but I think he has five position versatility. And apparently some teams are viewing him as a potential center, which is blowing my mind. But that just speaks to his athleticism and the way that he is viewed in the league as a versatile five tool offensive lineman. And for that reason, the Seahawks, Seahawks, the Seahawks having already gotten their two starting tackles in 2022, uh, Charles Cross and Abe Lucas, bang, pulled that uh, out of my there you uh, go. head, out of my head. Uh, those two guys are already locked down on the uh, ends of their uh, uh, line, but they could use some interior help and they could use a fantastic swing tackle. If need be, we saw one of those guys go down last year and they were plagued by um, failure to replace him sufficiently. So I think a Troy Fountain would be fantastic at 17. We get back to another AFC South team and I've got the Jaguars making amends for their Calvin Ridley blunder by going and getting Brian Thomas Jr., the wide receiver four in this class, out of LSU. This is a move that will, or at least should, anger most AFC South teams and fans because this is a fantastic pick, I think, for the Jaguars and for Trevor Lawrence. They need a guy like Thomas Jr., a bigger-bodied player capable of playing on the inside or the outside, brings a ton of explosiveness. I think that he would be a great fit for the Jaguars and then at 18 to round out 13 through 18. I've got your Bengals, JT, and I can't wait to hear your thoughts on this. Going with a bit of a luxury pick here, Olu Fashionu falls all the way to 18, which he may go 10 picks before this when all, all is said and done. But there are so many good tackles and only so many tackle landing spots in this, in this first round, in the first 20, that somebody's going to fall to the late teens, early 20s. And in my mock here, I've got Olu Fashionu falling 
not because he's a bad player, but because it, I don't know the tea leaves on the NFL side seems to be teams aren't as crazy about him as some of these other guys. And so I've got him going to the Bengals who just recently signed their literal twin towers of tackles. The two biggest tackles to have ever played in the NFL uh, with each other ever in uh, they add Trent Brown, a one year mercenary. And then help me out. Who's the other guy that is already Orlando on the Brown. Orlando, yeah, I knew it was another Brown. Orlando Brown and Trent Brown are both like 6'7", 6'8", and 300, 400,000 pounds, something like that. Uh, and so <laughs> Olaf Ashenu is not a guy that you need to come in and be the left tackle where he played in college. But he could start out as a guard on the inside or just make him a developmental player who for one year sits. And then once Trent Brown's one-year mercenary run is over, you say, thank you for your service. You bring him in or, again, not wishing this upon anybody, but you got two older tackles. Odds are they're not going to be able to make it through 17 games each. They're probably going to go down eventually, just playing the odds here. You've got a fantastic young tackle that can come in and maybe just take the reins over. And so I've got Olu Fashionu going to the Bengals at 18. JT, thoughts on all of those, but especially on your Bengals there. I mean, just like the comments, I'm all, I'm, I'm, I'm honestly shocked that Olu falls He's that far. Uh, to be honest, taking a lot of these other guys over it. I, I mm -hmm. mean, I as Chef Rand said, did Olu cuss out all the GMs I've seen him falling <laughs> in a lot of drafts? I think it's just that they're that he's been one of those mainstays at the top. And now you since you see all of these other offensive linemen and tackles rising up boards, someone has to fall and it right. starts to get left by the wayside because there's just so much attention on them. I, I, I personally think this would be a great pick for them. I think it's either offensive line for them uh, or a defensive side of the ball, whether that be on, on the defensive line with the exit of DJ reader or at the secondary with uh, the exit of Chidobe Awuzie. like mm -hmm. either of those two guys, they need help now on the defensive side of the ball there. But like you said, Trent Brown is not a solution for a long term there. So getting a guy like Olu in that building, I, I think Joe Burrow would be very happy about that one. And my only other qualm would be unless Brock Bowers is, somehow is at 18 when then I That's think you go Brock That's Bowers fair. no matter what for that team sure um but yeah I, I think on some of these other ones I think it's it, it's going to be really interesting to see which teams prioritize some of this really high-end tackle talent because like the Agreed. Seahawks Agreed. are also they they do need some help on the defensive side of the ball and as yep. more and more defense falls it'll be interesting to see how much of that they prioritize over getting a, a, a decent offensive line for the future so i think that'll be really interesting and then Brian Thomas Jr like you said it it feels crowded all of a sudden if you add another wide receiver there um into that room of Gabe Davis, Christian Kirk, uh, Evan Ingram and then Zay Jones but i think it even you with those alpha, other three though. players, you need another guy. And so, yeah, I agree with that. Brian Thomas Jr. there. Um, I, I, a lot of these players on here, I, I could see going um, to a lot of these different teams. Like if Brian Thomas Jr. is there for 18 at the Bengals, I could also see them just doing that and then kicking mm -hmm. that down the road and trading teams. Like, it's funny. I, I had Thomas penciled in at 18 for the, for the uh, Bengals. I was going kind of out of order. And then I was like, you know what? They're going to miss out on by one pick. And then I was like, what would they do? And so that's where we landed here. Um, Stoney in the comments saying uh, he, he's shocked by fashion who falling to 18. I know I, we explained why. Like, I, I get it. I am too. It, would I be surprised by this happening in real life? I would, even though I, I put it in the mock here. Um, but it, again, one of these top five, six tackles is going to fall. They have to. There aren't enough landings unless they just teams just say we don't care about what we need we're just going to take the best guys and we just go tackle 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 off the board which would be kind of electric if you just had like six tackles in the top 12 i'd be here for it um he was all of stony though is also here for Penix at 13 uh i'm not but i think it, it's likely to happen so that's why i did it uh and glory day sports saying he calls shenanigans the since he gets the best pick of the draft and he blames you jt Fair it's, enough. i didn't even it's not my mock draft it literally says East no but this Freeze. one this I one's had, your fault okay yeah no but this because it's the bengals pick so it's your fault yep all right. um all right let's go to the next slide here and we'll pick it up here as we get to the the last couple so we can not bury the lead and get to the titans seven round mock at 19 byron murphy First interior defensive line player going off the board to the Los Angeles Rams. Very simple here. Somebody's got to fill that black hole level of like, like existential need for help on the inside of the line for the Rams. The chasm that he leaves behind is so great. And yes, they have a fan. Uh, Kobe Turner. Is that the player who last year was playing on the inside for them? Um, I, I think I'm, 
got that right. Yep. Uh, and so he'll he'll step in there, but they could use some additional help to you know no not one man can replace the great Aaron Donald. So I've got Byron Murphy coming in to help along those lines at twenty. Uh, Art Smith's everywhere rejoice because Amarius Mims joins the offensive line group out of Georgia. Offensive tackle Amarius Mims, potentially the highest upside of any of the tackles in this draft class. Only eight starts in college, though, and so he is somebody that, of course, has a lot of question marks just due to having a lack of reps on tape. The size, the athleticism, everything else checks out with flying colors, A++ pluses across the board. And so I think the Steelers, that'd be a very Steelers. Like, there are certain teams that tend to get away with stuff in the draft. And you're like, how did they, what, how, how did we allow this to happen? And so this could be one of those picks for the Steelers at 21. I've got the Dolphins going JPJ Jackson powers, Johnson, a player that I know you and I are very high on, and he's a fantastic player. I'm so confident he's going to work out in the NFL, but you're not seeing him in everybody's first round mock. I'm kind of surprised by that. So maybe he falls further than we think. I'm going with what I believe. I'm going with my priors here. I think JPJ is absolutely a top 25 player in this draft, and the Dolphins sure could use a lot of help at center or at either guard position. They had a lot of issues at their interior offensive line last year. JPJ, big help in that regard. At 22, the Eagles are tired, sick and tired. They should be of their geriatric cornerback room was great until it wasn't very quickly. Those guys turn 30 and they fall off a cliff. And so Nate Wiggins, cornerback out of Clemson, comes in and helps out the Eagles at 22, a Howie Roseman pick that I think a lot of folks will be frustrated by because I think it's a very good one. And then 23, the Chargers, their second pick in the first round, they get out of the first round with a top tackle and with a top five wide receiver. I think it'd be a phenomenal haul for uh, Jim Harbaugh's group in his first year as head coach. They get Adonai Mitchell, A.D. Mitchell out of Texas, a player that you and I are going to spend a lot of time talking about over the next coming weeks because we have just thoughts, lots of thoughts and feelings on him that are conflicting, some very good, some very concerning. Um, a big game player who is capable of playing on the outside, not the greatest separator in the world, but somebody that absolutely is <laughs> sorry distracted by z dean reminding me that the dolphins just signed legend aaron brewer i i remember it so vividly that that's why i went with jpj at 21 um adnai mitchell at 23 though for the chargers I, I think that he's a guy that will be a big help in the receiving game to a justin herbert he needs a dude i think adnai mitchell is capable of being a dude and it, at his best in college, undeniable highs. It's just the lows and the inconsistency, some tendencies to disappear at times that have me a little bit concerned. But in general, the upside is there. So Adonai Mitchell at 23. At 24, Graham Barton to the uh, to to the uh, the star team. What are they? The cow the Cowboys. Um, I just I, my brain quit working for a second. Uh, the Cowboys go with Graham Barton at 24. Uh, the, the player out of Duke who was a tackle in college for most of his career, but being projected as an interior offensive lineman in this class due to just a, a general lack of length. Um, I do think he has some positional flexibility if needed on the outside, but in general, I think he's got a lot of potential to be a fantastic interior player. Stoney going back one pick saying his comp, his pro comp for Adonai Mitchell is a literal ghost. So we know where Stoney stands on that one. Uh, but yeah, Graham Barton at 24 to the Cowboys, not a whole lot to say there. And last slide here, the final, or excuse me. Uh, yeah, last slide. Number 25, uh, the great white hope, Cooper DeGene, cornerback out of <laughs> cornerback out of uh, Iowa. The first first round white cornerback since 1937, I believe. He is a wonder. Folks are going to want to say he's a safety because he's a white guy. And they're like, it's never going to work. He's just a freak. And I think he's going to, I think like you watch the tape, Stoney, I'd be curious if you believe this as well in the comments. He's a cornerback, man. Dude can hang. Uh, and so I think that he is a fantastic pick for the Packers to play alongside Jair Alexander, really bolster that defense at 26. What do the Bucks love to do more than get after the passer? Uh, that Todd Bowles pass rush happiness is going to be even happier once Latu Latu is added to that uh, group. And I've got Latu Latu and Jared Verse falling to 26 and 27. One of the bigger shocks, I think, in general for my first round pick here. Uh, I, I, I do think... For me, at least, JT, and I'm curious your thoughts on this. I'm not crazy about these pass rushers in general. Um, I do think that that uh, you've got you've got Turner at the top, and then there is a pretty significant gap for me before the Jared Verse 
Vaiatulatu, Chop Robinson, Darius Robinson, like that next group, I think is a clear second. And I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the rest of them not named Turner did fall. Yeah, I, I, I'm kind of with you on that one. My personal couple favorites are two of them that were that on the board Stoney. here. Uh, Liatu Latu go, go and then Darius Robinson. Those are two of my favorite guys um, out of that class. But I think guys like Jared Verse, I think, just had so much hype. And then you start the same thing kind of like with an Olu uh, Fashionu. It, it, it's kind of the same thing where you see all these other guys. And wow, there's no like game-breaking guys with that potential like a Dallas Turner. I think Liatu Latu and... and Darius Robinson and Jared verse are in that next tier, but not as good as say like the cornerback position or the wide receiver position this, this year. Um, and then I, yeah, as Stoney said, I was going to say something. No, you're I, wrong. I was, I was you're all say, wrong. I, I, I'm say, I don't my flag know on this. I, you're all wrong. I, I don't believe, I don't, I don't know if I, I agree with you on there because of how much just zone coverage he played. He struggled. You're all racist. Didn't this. have, this is all I, I didn't, he was, he didn't he play was a black, lot of man he coverage. Be saying this. If he uh, however, black, you wouldn't be saying this. How, however, however, I do still think it, it's a decent spot for him to go, considering they now have Xavier McKinney, Jair Alexander. He's sure. that guy that could also fit in there with that with that uh, that squad there that they have and work out really well. It just might. I be appreciate a you providing position. cover for my mock by pointing out. Yes, the the Packers could use either a safety or a cornerback there. I all of you, all of all of these guys. Stoney's saying he's the safetyest of safeties. Uh, Kenneth, uh, sorry, Kenneth's mad about Xavier Worthy. Sorry, Kenneth. Uh, he's, I don't think he's going in the first round. Uh, Chef Rand saying he's a, a safety. I, I, you're all wrong. I'm planting my flag today, March 26th. Cooper DeGene is a safety. Er, God damn, yeah, he is a <laughs> cornerback. <laughs> Cooper DeGene is a cornerback, and I will not change my opinion on that. I promise. I, I will live and die by that happening. Um, okay, so Stoney coming in though saying he does love the fit with the Packers. All right, well, I'll, I'll take that. Okay, back to these pass rushers and Latu Latu and Jared Verse going to 26 and 27 to the uh, the Buccaneers and the Cardinals. I think both teams, the story is very similar, right? They both could use pass rush help. One, because they do a lot of rushing the passer, pass, passer, passer, and have uh, had some turnover in recent years in the Buccaneers. And then Jared Verse going to the Cardinals because they like they desperately need a a a one pass rusher on the edge there. That's a big part of the rebuild that's necessary. So I've got them going there. Staying on the defensive line, though, at 28, uh, this will probably disappoint Bills fans because it's not the sexiest of picks. But I, I sat on this and thought about it for like 10 minutes. I, I feel safe in saying that they should go with Johnny Newton if he is there. Jerzon Newton out of Illinois, uh, a defensive lineman who I know Stoney's a huge fan of, by the way. No, not a Freudian slip. Shafran, Gordy Sports, shut up. You're both wrong. Uh, Dead gummit. I hate that I did that. Johnny Newton at 28 to the Bills. The reasoning behind this, while they could add wide receiver help here, and if it would it shock me if A.D. Mitchell was there, they go A.D. Mitchell. Would it shock me if uh, your boy Xavier Leggett is there, uh, and 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 they go with a Leggett as a, a another outside guy to complement Stephon Diggs? No, it would not. But what I think they need to get back to uh, from a defensive identity standpoint, and their defense is like, you know, injuries were a big deal, but it was the reason why. They fell apart down the stretch. They didn't fall apart, but ultimately fell apart in their final game and could not get a stop against the Chiefs. They need to get back to their old Sean McDermott ways of having like a, a hockey line level of defensive linemen. They just shifting guys in constantly and they're throwing fresh bodies in there and they're getting after the quarterback like crazy. And Johnny Newton would go a long way to helping that. So I have him going to 28, the uh, the interior defensive line product out of Illinois. At 29, Kool-Aid McKinstry goes to the Lions, Alabama cornerback, joining his former teammate, Brian Branch, the slot corner who's up there. The Lions desperately need help in the secondary. Um, they, they employed a former Titans legend last year whose name is escaping me at the moment, but I know he was the worst graded safety in or worst graded cornerback in the entire league. Kindle Vildor. Kindle Vildor. Thank you. Yes. I, how could I forget such a... Uh, magnanimous player. Kendall Vildor out, Kool-Aid McKinstry in. I think that is a stonks moment right there for the Lions, so I like that a lot. At 30, Tyler Guyton going to the Baltimore Ravens, who I'm not crazy about Tyler Guyton personally, but they did just ship out uh, Morgan Moses, traded him away to the Jets, uh, and R R Ronnie Stanley on the other side, struggling to stay healthy at this point in his career. I think a tackle would be very helpful for them, so they go Tyler Guyton out of Oklahoma. At 31, San Francisco adds to their pass rush arsenal. Speaking of having a lot of bodies to get after the quarterback, 
Darius Robinson, a player that I know we are very high on. I like a lot. Uh, so at 31, I, I have him going to the 49ers to uh, to play opposite Nick Bosa. And at 32, the Chiefs going with Kingsley Suomatea. I went uh, with him. I had a lot of different options here for the Chiefs. The champs could use uh, a, a handful of different things. I didn't want to force wide receiver here. You could, if 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 Kenneth wanted a consolation, I did think about Xavier Worthy here. But if they, you know, I, I probably would have done it too if they hadn't just gone and gotten Hollywood Brown. I think that Worthy would be kind of a redundant player. Those two guys, I think they have their Xavier Worthy now and Hollywood Brown already on the roster. So Kings Lusu and Matea, the BYU offensive tackle, going in and uh, helping bolster a, a Chiefs offensive line that their tackle situation was not great last year. I think Andy Reid would really like to have a guy there. All right. Any final thoughts, questions, comments on, uh, I know Stoney in the comments saying Darius Robinson for the 49ers simply would not be fair. I agree. And that's why I think you get to the last, you get to the last like quarter of the draft, you get into the late twenties and you tend to have really good players going to teams where you're like, dad gum it. This should be illegal. The, the FDA or the CDC, somebody should step in. The FBI maybe is where I should have started with that list should step in and stop this from happening. And yet it still happens. Yeah. I mean, that's for me, that's with Kingsley Suomatea, him going to the chiefs. I'm like, no, <laughs> don't, yes. I don't want to see Frustrating. one of my favorite players in the draft, go to a stupid team that I don't like. So <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I, I get that a lot. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with a lot of these, a lot of these teams, they're back here for a reason because they are pretty well built already, at least some of them in the back half. So getting those guys that aren't super sexy picks like a Johnny Newton or a Jared verse like that, I think that's where you're going to see a lot of these guys go. All right. We are already running late, but I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes flying through my seven round Titans mock for you guys. So we have the first round pick in Joe Alt. That is obvious. I'll say a couple more words just for continuity sake, I guess, for the content, right? Like Joe Alt, you have your lockdown left tackle. You don't have to worry about having no tackles anymore. The difference between having no tackles and only one tackle is so much bigger than the difference between having one tackle and two tackles, right? You can get away with having just one tackle in the NFL. You can scheme for it. You can chip for it. You can help for it. Having no tackles, the Titans have demonstrated firsthand for the better part of two years, is a massive, massive problem. And there's really nothing you can do about it. You're just dead in the water. So having Joe Alt on that left side, pairing him with Peter Skaronsky, fantastic left side of the offensive line for the Titans for the next decade. Moving on, the Titans make a trade in the second round. And I want them so badly to trade one of these first two picks. I think reading the tea leaves, it seems less likely today than ever that that first round pick is going to be traded, partially because I think they want to stick there and pick, and partially because... I think that it sounds like they haven't had a whole lot of interest, right? This is the nosy season, as GM Rand Carthen says, where GMs are in each other's business trying to figure out who's where, why, how, and can we maybe move there for this price? And he said this week at the owners' meetings that the Titans have still not had a whole lot of serious interest in the seventh overall pick. So set that aside. Let's say they trade the second round pick. They have number 38 overall. I have them in this situation trading with the Pittsburgh Steelers. The Titans move back and acquire that third round pick. They do not have in this draft something that they would greatly benefit from having. So they move back from 38 to 51 in the second round and add 3.84 so the 84th overall pick. And they give away 38 for the Pittsburgh Steelers to move up in the second round, as well as one of their seventh round picks, the pick that they just got in the pick swap with the Kansas City Chiefs to uh, 252 overall. Then with their second round pick at 51 overall, they go with Chris Braswell and edge out of Alabama. And I was talking, you and I and Stoney, we're all talking with our buddy Zach Lyons about how Man, it's easy if you're doing just like a PFF mock draft simulator to go Joe Alt, Chris ba Braswell as their first two picks, even if they're still at 38, because Braswell is a guy that falls into that category, JT, that I love to talk about. Guys that played at the same school, at the same position, in the same draft class. Typically, the second guy gets undervalued. And I think that Edge, Chris Braswell, being behind Turner, who's going to be a top 10, top 15 pick, is uh, a candidate for like, like, let's look into this guy a little bit more. Maybe he's better than folks are, are giving him credit for. And you look at some of his numbers. He's a big kid, 6'3", 255, impressive athlete, uh, very explosive first step, natural strength, all of the things on paper, the general traits that you want for an NFL edge rusher. Uh, he may not ever be a pass rush like technician per se, 
but the power, the speed, the length, all of those things, he's going to have a rotational floor as an edge rusher with an upside to be an impact starter. I think that is a, a move that they could absolutely. <laughs> and Glory Day Sports recommending just recreate the Alabama pass rush. Just go Turner at seven, Braswell at 38. Who says no? I say no, but it would be kind of funny. It'd be a cool experiment. It'd be a good bit. Um, yeah, I, I think that Braswell at, at 51 would be a, a good pick for them. And Lord knows they need help on the edge. Yeah, I agree with you there. I think that would be a great pick for them because of what we saw at, his, at, at the Senior Bowl. And just going back, like you said, playing there's a lot of players in this draft that because of their counterparts being uh, so much more notable, you kind of see them uh, kind of fall by the wayside and go under the radar. So I think that there is a really real possibility that he could still be there in the later second, mid to later second round. Um, and then also you get this third round pick that we'll go to. Yeah, so in the third round pick, they addressed the receiver position. I thought about not, but I knew folks would be mad if I didn't. And I selfishly would like them to address receiver somewhere in the day two, early day three conversation of this draft, even though they went and got Calvin Ridley. And so I've got them going with Javon Baker, wide receiver out of UCF, a guy that um, I know maybe no bigger a, a uh, advocate for Javon Baker than Mike Herndon. Uh, our buddy uh, from the F words pod, big Javon Baker fan. I, I enjoy a Javon Baker as well. I think that if he fell to 84 as squared up as saying he might be a steal there. I did all of these, by the way, just based on guys that would be available at that pick um, on the consensus mock draft database. So that is what this is based off of. If your argument is, I don't think he's there. Like I get it. He may very well not be, but as like the later you get into the, the draft, the, the more you're doing a lot of guesswork here. He's a guy that um, had a very good 2023, played in 13 games, had uh, had uh, almost 1,200 yards, 21 yards per reception, seven touchdowns, only six drops. Um, he, he was a three-year player in college with UCF. Uh, I, I, I think that he's a really competent player that is really only lacking in a big way as a contested catch a guy for his size. Um, six one two oh eight. I you I, I would like for it to be better than it is. His contested catch rate in college being fifty six percent. Um, so you know he's going to get open more than he's going to be a ball winner at the the top of the at the top of the route. I do like him a lot, and I see folks in the comments saying Malik Washington in the fourth. Uh, they prefer I I like Malik Washington as well. Actually, he was in my list of guys that I might potentially go with, but I go with Baker instead out of UCF. All right, then Cedric Gray linebacker out of North Carolina. And like I said earlier, you've got to start including these linebackers in your mock draft based on what the Titans brass has been saying. They need a guy that can be the green dot. So don't just go and pick like, you don't pick a Tommy Eichenberg out of, out of Ohio state, a guy that is like an old school thumper downhill, but can't cover to save his life that they have that guy in Kenneth Murray. Uh, they need a guy that can wear the green dot and not be a complete and utter liability in coverage. And so I went with Cedric gray, a linebacker out of UNC at a 78 PFF coverage grade last year. He's a very good pass rusher and a very good cover uh, coverage guy. His run defense is where uh, he does not quite fit the bill, but a, a decent compliment, I think, to a guy like Kenneth Murray. And so I go with Cedric Gray at the fourth round pick in the fifth round. JT, I have Malik Mustafa. I addressed the safety position here, a player out of Wake Forest. He is somebody that is more of a traditional old school safety um, in the sense that I'm trying to pull up my notes on him here uh, in the sense that he is, is not going to do his best work as a one high guy, but in a two high shell um, where he you know, can keep the play in front of him, fire downhill when he's needed. Um, even as an all out blitzer, he, he, he's a valuable player that I think you can find in the, in the late rounds. He's got that skill set mentality of a throwback, strong safety. Um, lack you know, he's a fourth round player because he's not the most fluid not the most long player but he's tough he's got power he's got a high motor all of these things uh i think an ideal safety developmental player in that way um chef ran strong take saying that he thinks mustafa is an even better player than cam kitchens a, a popular pick out of miami i believe and then let's power through these last couple guys i'm not gonna lie i don't have a ton of thoughts on them christian boyd uh is the last guy that i do feel personally pretty convicted about um, not just because the Titans need interior defensive line help, and he would be a nice player to be able to pair with Jeffrey Simmons, but uh, out of Northern Iowa, Northern Iowa Panthers, great Christian Boyd. Uh, I, I I see a lot of things that are to be liked here. He's a redshirt senior, so he's on the older side, but 6'4", 317, um, had a, a very strong grade as a run and pass defender. Um, 
got three sacks and nine hits as an interior player in his last season. Uh, 28 hurries gets after the quarterback effectively. And uh, he's, he's got the size and the athleticism to boot. I think that he would be a really nice ad for the Titans in the sixth round. And then a couple of seventh round guys, JT Nathaniel Watson linebacker at Mississippi state. We saw him at the senior bowl. He's a player that I think could be a developmental special needs guy that uh, special oh, special teams guy. There we go. That was that's, there's, there's your slip for the day. Uh, Nathaniel Watson, special teams player out of Mississippi state. Um, he's, he's somebody that I think you could have around to potentially develop into a starting linebacker for you. And then Tanner Bortolini, uh, excuse me, an interior offensive lineman out of Wisconsin graded highly um, falling. Cause he's just not the greatest athlete. And uh, you know, it, is a developmental guy, not the most polished player in the world out of Wisconsin, but you add some depth on the inside of your offensive line where they could use depth pretty much anywhere on this offensive line. So that is my seven round Titans mock draft in review at seventh overall, Joe Alt offensive tackle of no out of Notre Dame at 51 overall after a trade back in the second round, Chris Braswell edge out of Alabama at 84 overall, Javon Baker wide receiver out of UCF at 106 Cedric gray linebacker out of UNC. 146, Malik Mustafa, safety out of Wake Forest. 182, Christian Boyd, defensive lineman out of Northern Iowa. 221, Nathaniel Watson, linebacker out of Mississippi State. And 227, Tanner Bottolini, an interior offensive lineman out of Wisconsin. Okay, that's a lot of words from me, but that is our show. JT, any thoughts on the seven round mock? Are we ready to get out of here? I, I think there's a couple of people in the comments here saying, Basically, the sentiment, a box is being checked. Still quite a few needs. Can't fix it all, but this mock mm -hmm. is helpful, and I think that's what the Titans are going to do here. They kind of went out and, like we've been talking about, get their big-name guys because now it's time where you build up that depth underneath it so that you can uh, extend your, your, your time period, that you can be competitive, and I think that's what they're going to do through this draft and address as many needs as they can while also – being conscious of knowing they can't fill them all. So I think it checks a lot of boxes that they still need to be checked. Sure. Uh, and then Gory Day Sports saying he likes Tanner a lot, mainly because his last name sounds like a pasta noodle. Maybe I was just hungry when I made this. That's a, uh, that's a possibility. All right. That is our mock draft 1.0, JT. Thanks for being along for the ride. Thanks to all of you in the comments who are with, with us live today. We'll have mock draft 2.0 and 3.0 coming up in the next, we're probably almost one month out from the draft now. We exactly one month uh, out this are, Thursday. I we think? are less. Yeah, we're is, less than a month from the draft now. Are we? Is it yep. not this Thursday? Is the okay? Are we? Are you sure about that? I'm. Positive. I think we're. I think this yes. Thursday. I think this Thursday is one month from the draft, right? Because isn't the draft the twenty seventh? No, it's the twenty fifth. Oh, okay. Well, hey, we're less than a month from <laughs> from the draft. I should never question producer JT on the logistical things. Fair enough. Um, D good saying subscribe people. Easton has a baby to feed. Yes, it's not here yet, but it will be soon. So this is true. Please subscribe. I would appreciate that at Broadway sports media's YouTube page and make sure you're following us on social media at hot read pod on TikTok, Twitter, and Instagram until Thursday, JT will be traveling. So I'll be joined by the stove, the Sobros network man himself, Stony Keeley. We're going to be talking about the draft. What exactly in the draft? We're going to decide that later, but it's going to be a good time. Stony looking forward to having you in. Make sure you're tuning in with us live on Thursday afternoon. I believe we're going to be going live at six. Uh, so a little bit later of a start, but great entertainment as you're making your dinner on Thursday night. So make sure to tune in then until then for producer JT, I'm your host Easton freeze. This has been the hot read podcast. We'll talk to you later.